end of the session to talk about it now. Thank you, sir. Thank you, team. Ready to give me a wonderful opportunity to be here in this wonderful evening to discuss about the real phase of antibiotics in which it's going to have a significant impact in your gastroenterology. Apart from that, what, is, what do you mean by gut microbiota? And in what way the antibiotics is going to have an impact on your gut microbiota? That's the main area for me to take on the discussion for the next 20 to 30 minutes with you all. As you all know, right from 18th century onwards, antibiotic, the greatest medical breakthrough before the 20th century, infectious diseases accounted for high morbidity as well as mortality worldwide. It's very well known about that. So what we are going to discuss about that, there are a huge list of antibiotics starting from a penicillin group in which the basic discovery in 1928 strongly marked the beginning of antibiotic era that revolution is a treatment for infectious diseases. So once the initiation of antibiotic, in what way it is going to affect your gut microbiota, how the gut microbiota is going to get disrupted. Apart from that, what do you mean by ubiosis? What do you mean by dysbiosis? And what do you mean by symbiosis? All those things briefly we are going to discuss here. Apart, antibiotics, the life savers. Over the last 80 years, the widespread use of antibiotics has saved millions of lives not only for your gastrointestinal system, apart from that, your liver, your respiratory, cardiovascular, in huge area, antibiotics having a huge response and role. And based upon that, how is it going to have an impact on your gut microbiota briefly? That's the area for me to take on the discussion. So the antibiotic have served as a principal weapon in the fight against various bacterial infections. In addition to treat infectious diseases, antibiotics have made modern medical procedures possibly, including for all cancer treatment, organ transplants, your open heart surgery, all those things being possible with your antibiotic, which mainly play the game as lifesavers. 18 out of 1,000 people, as per the census, take antibiotics every day, have drastically changed modern medicine and extended the average human lifespan by 20 to 23 years as of now, the data which is progressing and which has been showing right now. The colossal threat of antibiotic resistance. As we all know, if you are going to use antibiotic for a duration of time, so what is going to happen, you may have a antibiotic resistance. Because of widespread overuse and misuse, bacteria causing both benign as well as life-threatening infections have become increasingly resistant to them. According to the source from WHO, antibiotic resistance is one of the biggest threats to global health, food security, as well as your developmental delay. So infections caused by resistant bacteria are difficult to treat, which leads to higher cost of medical treatment, and prolonged duration of your hospital stay, as well as increased mortality being reported because of that. From the antibiotic era to the microbiota era, what do you mean by the gut microbiota? Why the such things have been taken over right now? So usually the gut microbiota, if you're going to look into the diverse microbial community, you list of organisms being taken. And if you're going to see a gut microbiota, more than trillion microorganisms being enclosed in that, and which is called as the gut microbiota. So 10 power 13 to 10 power 14 microorganisms, starting from your intrauterine period, right from your mother's womb. And from there, the complete fat is going to get involved in development of your gut microbiota. More than 1,000 species and more than 7,000 strains. And if you're going to look into your microbial genome, so it contains almost around 3 to 10 power 6 of genes, apart from the base, it complete system which weighs almost around 1 to 2 kg. The gut arbor, both symbiotic as well as your pathogenic bacteria, so what is going to happen in your microbiota? So it's going to have a balanced, mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship It's going to happen to maintain your overall health. 
from the antibiotic era to the microbiota era, microbiota are disruptors. So what is going to happen that once you're going to use antibiotics for a duration of time, will predispose to dysbiosis. See, there are huge list of diseases being reported because of this gut microbiota disruption. For example, starting from your inflammatory bowel disease, starting from your irritable bowel syndrome and various allergic colitis, for example, your metabolic parameters like your obesity, for example, various malignant factors like colonic malignancy, even for your mental stress and mental illness, there are a huge list of components there, as I discussed with you. So antibiotic, if it is going to get exposed, it's going to disrupt your gut microbiome by eradicating your taxa as well as reduced overall diversity causing antibiotic associated dysbiosis. So detrimental effects of antibiotics are documented on the trillions of commensal gut bacteria. Even brief exposure to antibiotics can lead to long lasting alterations in your microbiome. So a single short course of antibiotic can drastically alter the GI flora leading to changes in composition, diversity, metabolic function and resistance gene expression. So microbiota disruptures your antibiotic associated dysbiosis weakens the protective function of the gut microbiota. If you're going to see what are the various protective factors are going to get involved, for example, in the short term, in the long term, the dysbiosis, what is going to happen? Once the dysbiosis leaves the door open for opportunistic pathogens and the selection of multi-resistant bacteria. In the long term, the gut microbiota, despite having a good resilience, can sometimes fail to fully restore itself, which paves the way to harbor multiple diseases. For example, there are, as I discussed, more than 23,000 genes have been isolated so far. And what are the various things we need to look? For example, if you're going to take too much of sugar intake, if you're short in fatty acids, if it is going to come down, and for example, if you are going to take too much of proton pump inhibitors, for example, if you are going to take too much of high protein, and if you got a so the voice is disrupted. Please maintain your mute mode. And as a mute mode, please. Please look into that. And decrease levels of your short chain fatty acids and increase levels of your lipopolysaccharide, which will predispose to various cardiovascular diseases, which may predispose to your gut inflammation. And all those things can happen when you're going to use your antibiotics, followed by the gut microbiota if it is going to get disrupted. So the various protective mechanism has to get enrolled. Those things, certain slides I couldn't able to point out, but you should not forget that. Your SCFA production has to be augmented. Your, your antioxidant levels has to be well maintained. Uh, and for example, you need to reduce your toxins production from the kidneys and you need to improve your lipid metabolites as well as your lowering of your gut inflammation as well as improving your insulin sensitivity. All those things will be acting as a puncher to involve in the armamentarium of management, management of this antibiotic associated dysbiosis. For example, if you're going to take this flow chart, it's very interesting. The gut dysbiosis, see now the gut microbiota being considered as a separate system for discussion and no organs being existing right now when you're going to manage a patient without gut microbiota. So gut microbiota alteration can be considered as a separate topic, separate area of interest right now. That's the most important entity, not only for gastroenterology, even for multiple other systems. This has a strong potential role that has to be strongly considered. The gut dysbiosis, it's going to trigger by antibiotic can lead to complex downstream effects on your gut barrier function, your gene expression, your epigenetic modifications, and available initials for your pathogenic bacteria as well as for your biofilm formation. So once the antibiotic induced dysbiosis, if it is going to get established, 
So the richness and uh, diversity of microbiome is going to get take on. Once you're going to use your antibiotic, what's going to happen? The generation of mesh for pathogenic bacteria, once it's going to get disrupt your barrier and it is going to expose your luminal antigen for your various immune cells and response, which predispose to alteration and regulation of your gene expression and epigenetic modifications. So what is going to happen? Now might be evidence of your local as well as your systemic inflammation. So what is going to happen? Your interleukins is going to get released. At that point, your TL per cells and TL per one and 17 is going to get activated, followed by you may land up with multiple diseases, starting from your intrauterine to other, to your complete adult phase of life. You may have various chronic events as a day progress, you may have enrolled and listed. So it might be predisposed to allergic, autoimmune disorders, infectious pathology, as well as inflammatory, your metabolic, as well as your neoplastic parameters. The basic thing, as we are going to take on with this antibiotic, once the gut microbiota is going to get disrupted, the role of probiotics is going to get into that. Nowadays, probiotic, prebiotic, and symbiotic, all those things be well known about that. That's a separate area for discussion. But certain points, we should not forget about this. AAD, as a practicing physician, you are not supposed to forget once you're going to hit the patient with antibiotic, always remember the simple pneumonitol, tetracycline, ampicillin, lincomycin, clindamycin, that might predispose to worsening of your antibiotic associated diet. You need to be very, very cautious and some pointers. You need to subject the patient with vancomycin and other supports to manage this kind of presentation. So AAD is one of the most common adverse events based upon your antibiotic ch choice. And it can be early, it can be delayed up to two months after discontinuation. Even after two months, you may have presentation. Sometimes the patient may have acute colitis. Sometimes the patient may have fulminant colitis in which your accounts may go high. You may have some prominent toxic dilatation of your colon. And sometimes you may have multiple other complications. You may have a dangerous fulminant septicemia. There may be in super vein when you are coexisting this kind of presentation. And always, if the patient is going to be immunosuppressed at that point of time, the worsening of antibiotic associated diarrhea, for example, in case we are having evidence of IBD, a colonic malignancy, other pathology, that's a pointer for the patient to have worsening of AAD to take on. So indicators for antibiotic associated, I mean, incidence of your AAD depends upon multiple factors such as age, your various settings and the type of antibiotic usage up to predominantly around 30 to 35 percent of the population will be involved in pediatric age group up to 70 percent of the case 70 to 80 percent of the case reports are there in pediatric age group so once a gut dysbiosis is going to get triggered by your antibiotic what is going to happen that might be having downstream effects in your gut barrier function your gene expression your epigenetic modifications and your niches for pathogenic bacteria and biofilms is going to get disrupted these things you should not forget. And once the antibiotic associated diner is going to get check on, there are huge, huge list of antibiotics are there. For example, your penicillins, your cephalosporins, your macrolides, commonly used antibiotic, your lincosomides, for example, your clindamycin, and for example, your streptogramins, like your clistinomycin, your quinorones, ciprofrox, frequently used your cyclings like your doxy and other multiple like your septron and your cortamoxazole along with your metronazole can predispose to AAD when you're going to use at long duration. For example, when you're going to use triple drug therapy, for example, for H. pyre eradication, that might predispose to AAD. You need to be very cautious because nowadays intensified regimen is a two grams regimen of amoxicillin has come into the market. So you need to be very conscious when you're going to use amoxicillin for a duration of time to prevent this AAD. The AAD caused by cross deficit, as you are well known, when antibiotic dysbiosis will going to happen, what is going to happen? Around one in every three cases of AAD are due to cross deficit. As you all know, it's a gram-positive, spore-forming, it's an obligative anaerobe, which persists in the environment via spore formation. So in antibiotic dysbiosis, what is going to happen? 
this boy is going to get germinated and it's going to predispose to various opportunistic pathogens and thou might be having evidence of your intestinal colonization, your toxins, as you all know well about the toxin A as well as B is going to get well secreted by your deficit and it's going to damage your colonic mucosa which will predispose to augmentation of your inflammatory response to take on. So this AAD caused by C difficile, what is going to happen once you're going to get ingest your spores, which is happening in your environment, which is going to get passed into your, inter your intestine and from the by a diary and the spore is going to get released. Apart from that, what is going to happen once you're going to use this antibiotic, the germination of spores, the C difficile bacteria is going to get accumulated in your lumen and it's going to penetrate into your microbial barrier, which is going to attach into your various enterocytes. And from there, your toxins of Clostridium difficile is going to get released, which will set this inflammatory response and cytokine reaction is going to get taken on. At that point of time, the patient may have multiple pictures like your acute, fulminant, other colitis may get reported because of AAD. Apart from that, the association of antibiotics with C. difficile has been established well in hospitals and more recently in your community settings too. In a hospital setting, the highest risk of developing CDI was observed for cephalosporins among them, the second to fourth generation. And clindamycin, your carbapenums and trimethoprim sulfonamides, your quinolones as well as your penicillin combination, what I've discussed. So the gut microbiota has been considered as a reservoir for antibiotic resistance. When exposed to antibiotic, the microbial community, the protective environment, the gut microbiota, the good bacteria is going to have a which respond in the short term, not only by changing the composition, but also by evolving, optimizing, and disseminating antibiotic resistant genes. Antibiotics reduce the relative abundance of your microbes in your gut, as well as increase in the number of resistant genes. The gut microbiota overly exposed to antibiotics is now considered as a significant reservoir for your resistant genes to get activated. By contributing to the growing difficulty to combat bacterial infections, antibiotic resistance has become a major public health concern as of now. Once the dysbiosis is going to get take on, which is contributing to your various chronic diseases, as I already discussed, your asthma, your IBD, one common entity, because the one single pointer you cannot able to identify your IBD. Now, even in alcoholic hepatitis, once the patient is going for evidence of worsening of your <coughs> liver parameters at that point of time, the patient may have worsening of your gut dysbiosis itself so being taken as a separate pathophysiological component to discuss about this gut dysbiosis and your metabolic parameters like your diabetes, your obesity, your metabolic syndromes, and apart from that, your psychiatric diseases like your depression and anxiety, you should not forget about this, which may contribute to your dysbiosis and which may contribute to the risk of your chronic diseases. So what is going to happen once the patient is going to land up with evidence of IBD, which is more common in ulcerative colitis than in Crohn's. So AAD is going to have a significant role. As we all know, ulcerative colitis is a disease which is predominantly restricted to your large bowel, but in Crohn's, the disease even starting from your mouth to anal canal, it can involve any region of your GI tract. So Inflammatory AAD, the most common event, we should not forget about. Isolated colitis is one of the predisposing worsening events if the patient is having in the background. So antibiotic associated dysbiosis may, may go to may, may be done to take on a worsening event at that point of time. The patient who have received more than three or more previous antibiotic, there are 50 to 55 percent of increased risk of inflammatory bowel disease compared to no antibiotic usage. And early exposure to antibiotic in children was associated with 5 to 5.5 fold increased incidence of your IBD risk being reported. So inflammatory bowel disease, even if the patient is active or in normal, once the patient is going to, I mean, get into the face of a reasonable response, 
thou might be having evidence of relapse once the patient is going to have this antibiotic associated dysbiosis is going to get take on so you need to maintain a eubiosis to prevent this event and you need to prevent this diarrheal complications cross bear cross with deficit and other organisms which is being frequently reported in this antibiotic associated dysbiosis apart from that the common entity frequently encountering the functional ga even nothing but irritable bowel syndrome also known as your gut and brain syndrome which as per your latest room guidelines what they're going to mention you might be having a change in frequency the abdominal pain will be a characteristic precipitation your frequency of stool your form of stool might get older but the alarming feature usually will be less when you're going to think about this irritable bowel syndrome when compared to your inflammatory event of your bowel so ibs we are going to look into that it's a common gastrointestinal disorder as a discuss recurrent discomfort of pain and in danish hard study antibiotic use was associated with 80% higher odds of your development regarding your irritable bowel syndrome so the gut disturbances in the composition of gut microbiota is involved in the pathogenesis of your ibs so you should be very cautious if you are going to manage a patient with irritable bowel syndrome and when you are going to use a molecule you need to be assume you need to be cautious you are going to tackle a component of diarrhea or you are going to tackle a component of constipation or you are going to tackle a component of mixed presentation it could be ibs c d or it could be ibs mixed you need to be very cautious based upon the antibiotic dysbiosis is always having a common uh, common role to take on in this management in this worsening of pathophysiology of your ibs and role of probiotics to discuss briefly there are so much so many probiotics as we all know it's nothing but it's going to give a living microorganisms in reasonable adequate amount it's going to conquer a reasonable health benefit to the host that's what is nothing but it's probiotic what do you mean by prebiotic when you're going to have a synthetic component like your fructose or your saccharides you know in all those components might be a prebiotic symbiotic it's nothing but a combination so probiotic lactobacillus and and streptococcus so many other things are there along with yeast based probiotics are there so all those things starting from your rhamnosus to rituri starting from your component of your saccharomyces boulardii which is being known predominantly by yeast component there are so many probiotics being there to involve in the management of patient with antibiotic associated dysbiosis so it's going to improve your microbial balance it's going to reduce the colonization by your pathogenic bacteria so the temporarily colonize the gi tract what is going to happen there are you list of action it's going to act on inflammatory it is going to act on pamp and dam pathway it is going to act on cytokines there are so many other the defense in the bacteriocin and so many components are there in the mechanism of action you list to discuss fantastic area to discuss about the probiotic the main component of action stream in which we are going to use in the management of antibiotic associated dysbiosis but that's not the area to concern right now but you should remember that the bacterial acids your peptides is going to compete for your nutrient support and your addition into your epithelium this is the main path for it to get target on apart from that your bacterial probiotics as i said discuss like your bifidobacterium your lactobacillus your yeast derivative forms like your saccharomyces you list are there when you're going to see so what is the mechanism it's going to create a favorable micro environment your streptococcus blood is strained both during your dysbiotic situation in the prevention of your dysbiosis so discuss on saccharomyces boulardii so what's going to happen it's going to have a protective action against the pathogens and the toxins so it stabilizes the healthy microbiota it is going to improve the enzymatic function of your mucosal sense in case of any dysbiosis what is going to happen the protection against this pathogens and toxins the regeneration of mucosal cells is going to get established a regeneration stabilization of your healthy microbiota 
along with your enzymatic function of your mucosal cells is going to get augmented. That's why the role of probiotics is going to be strongly established to maintain your gut symbiosis. That's very, very important. We're not supposed to forget, based upon the various clinical scenario, even then there are no much of papers to document that might be evidence to still the research you 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 list being documented in various studies not only for ivd ivs so many other lists starting from your respiratory system to other system now the role of probiotics has been strongly checking out in the management of your antibiotic associated diarrhea along with multiple other complications like ivs and ivd apart from that this paper, and you're going to look into, look into your systematic review and mature analysis, which was done 21 RCTs, 4780 patients being studied. What they've been mentioning that when you're going to administer Saccharomyces boulardii, the yeast derived form of probiotic, so it is going to reduce your AAD by around 53 percentage for every 10 patients receiving daily boulardii with antibiotics, you may have very few episodes to a worsening of diarrheal events. And in this study, what they have mentioned, uh, it's around 363 children with acute diarrhea, they've been taken, and probiotics, I mean, the Saccharomyces bloody significantly reduces the duration of diarrhea by almost around 24 hours. When you're going to look into this control, and the mean length of emergency care unit stay was also short of more than 19 hours versus your control. And this study being proven accordingly. And co-administration of your blood along with your antibiotic reduces hospital-associated clostridial difficile infection, nothing but your AAD. It's a retrospective study which was done in 8,000 patients in which if you're going to use a uh, uh, what is going to have the impact in your CDI, clostridium difficile? The patient co administered streptococcus bladi with antibiotic. The 43% reduced risk of hospital associated <coughs> CDI. And once a patient being co administered within 24 hours of antibiotic start, at around 53% reduced risk of hospital onset CDI versus those after 24 hours of antibiotic start. So the, what is the main message we need to involve, we need to say what is the probiotic you are going to use, not a major concern, either it's yeast derivative or if it is a bacterial formation or whatever is the bacterial lactobacillus or Saccharomyces boulardii or whether it is because of streptococcus. But see, well, the one thing you should not forget when you're going to manage, you should target the gut microbiota, you should target the CUBIOSIS to get well maintained when you're going to manage any patient with evidence of this gut dysbiosis. So we, our strong intention, we need to prevent this gut dysbiosis and we need to maintain a eubiosis. And in order to prevent, in order to establish the gut microbiota, which contains almost a trillion microorganisms to have an efficient role in management of your various systems be involved. So before concluding the key takeaways, we should not forget that so the antibiotics are lifesavers that are markedly improved the human lifespan, but the misuse are led to a global threat of antibiotic resistance. And point number two, antibiotic exposure disrupts your gut microbiota, which lead to your dysbiosis. And there might be evidence of antibiotic associated diarrhea, nothing but your clostridium difficile pindor predisposed. At that point of time, based upon your clinical presentation, you may use vancomycin, predominantly a word, Support apart from that, so many other molecules like phenoxamine and other molecules are there, but you should not forget the clinical recognition of these pointers in early phase when you're going to manage the patient as a, from a gastroenterologist point of view. Apart from that, the risk of AAD is high when you're going to use various antibiotics like your penicillin, cephalosporins, your macrolides, and one in three cases, every three cases of AD due to C difficile that can severely may damage your GI tract, which may predispose to toxicity of your colon. Apart from that, at that point, the gut microbiota overly exposed to antibiotics is now becoming a reservoir for your resistant genes to take on. And antibiotic associated dysbiosis also contribute to the risk of chronic diseases. And probiotics definitely play a significant major role in restoring the balance of gut microbiota. 
the yeast form Saccharomyces boulardii, there might be some papers to show the beneficial response in your gut microbiome to maintain a symbiosis and to prevent this antibiotic associated diarrhea. And in order to maintain the UBS, in order to establish your normal gut microbiota, which is being now separately being taken on as a separate system for discussion. With this, I'm happy to rest my presentation. If there are any questions to take on, please proceed with that. Thank you all for patient listening. Thank you so much, sir.